Everybody's story throughout the ages, even if only behind, the audience requires a point of view, a way into the story, a narrative voice. But more than that, a narrative character, an implied guide at times nearly non-existent, passing through walls, the minds of the characters, and others more present and solid with the very stuff of the story. The inferred 13th disciple, the one that took the photo at the Last Supper, the persistent spirit who knows precisely where the action is thickest, which angle will be the most dramatic, lurking directly in front of each character, major or minor, at the drama plays it across. The proverbial fly on the wall. And so gentle is it. For this story, I have rented the bodies of Luna Moths for the moments, for the duration of this tale. The upside being we travel together unhindered and unnoticed on silky quiet wings can see things from multiple angles and from on high without being seen. The downside is that we are only able to witness the parts of the story that take place during the event. Although, as every teenager knows, that is when the most exciting things occur. <laughs> also, also, we are irresistibly drawn to bright and dangerous light. And speaking of light, our story begins under painfully brilliant stars. I can't emphasize enough how bright, although it matters little to the story, one must be honest finally in the telling. Stars so brilliant, a sane person might contemplate glaring with a million different sunscreens, all with different properties and strengths to guard against their varied and exotic rays. Stars so stupendously luminous that were this a regular nightly occurrence, it is not. The ancients, instead of pondering the stars, would have wondered instead of the strangely shaped black spike placed here in It takes all our monthly effort to stay anchored to this darker world below, but we have a tale to follow and to tell, lights of a different sort to follow. Under these very stars, a great sandy beach stretches for miles in a gentle arc below and to both sides of us, a lullaby and long. A low stretch of forest can be seen dark and jagged against the starshine, dark except for a little clearing emptying into it the upper beach, a shallow bowl carved into the forest. In the center of the clearing is a squat house, overcome with flame. We moths are holding fast, barely. Below us, and just in time, we see a fox alone upon the beach, the flame a flicker on his teeth. There are two large chests, scooting towards him through the sand from the direction of the house. What did you manage to sell? asked the fox, looking at a black stain on his sleeve. I barely made it out with my skin intact. The cowboy box and the old steamer chest near the door, keeps a small voice from the vicinity of the boxes. A formerly white mouse appears from behind the hindquarters and hops gingerly to the fox, trailing a thin wisp of smoke. It appears to be favoring its left front paw. That's all. Pity. But it'll have to do. Plum, my girl, where are your shoes? Burnt up, says the mouse. After I managed to drag your boxes out there, there wasn't any time. And you so love those shoes, says the fox, looking out over the ocean. Yes, sir, you see, they cover my feet, especially when I'm hauling such heavy loads. Otherwise, I'm just fine without them, the fox interrupts. I so could have used the other boxes. I dueled her in three days. You are sure there is no returning to the house for more? I'm afraid not, sir. I'd surely die. Of course. And it was very valiant of you to salvage what little you did. <laughs> Plum blushes. Now, if you could just load the cart, we'll be off. Plum's face falls. She shakes her head. The cart burnt as well, says the fox. How exquisitely inopportune. I'm beginning to feel that this fire may have been her doing. She has a left-handed grace. Some say she is a sorceress. When I defeat her, you may have her head to chew on. I mostly just eat seeds, but thank you, sir. Sometimes fudge as well. <laughs> there was a long while wherein little can be heard but the faint shushing of the gentle surf, the occasional far-off pop and crack of the blazing house, and perhaps the impossible spit that can sizzle with the stars. The fox is gazing intently out across the starlit water. The moose, or the, excuse me, the mouse, looks out as well, but soon becomes restless. She sings a little song from her mousehood. Luma, 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 Luma. She croons in a whisper. 
After the seventh time through, she becomes bored and begins licking her singed feet. Sir, says Plum after a time. Yes, says the fox, startled from the thought. Excuse me, but where are we going to go now? The fox thinks a moment, stroking his whiskers. Plum, queries quietly. What exactly do we have packed in the steamer chest? Food, I think. Trade goods, mostly beads and silk kerchiefs. All our extra clothes. Oh, the Italian masks, too. Empty it out. All of it? Yes, says the fox. Within an hour, they have set sail. They sail throughout the rest of the night and through the next day, we must assume, for you and I have slept the day atop the makeshift driftwood mast, following the east coast north. Always north. The sea is obstinately, almost pugnaciously glassy, refusing the ministrations of the breeze that tickles across it lightly like a finishing polish, like an afterthought. Plum is curled up in the nose of the mask she has insisted on saving. The fox is rummaging through the contents of the cowboy box, muttering, planning. A litter of discarded items floats along in their wake like mismatched colorful ducklings. Beside him in the steamer trunk, a sombrero, a ten-gallon hat, and a boulder are laid in row according to size. You and I float lightly above, shadow kisses fluttering against the stars. Plum sleeps, I think, and dreams of food. I surmise this because the fox and mice are different creatures. The fox may dine one day and not eat for free. The mouse, however, has very little bank, is ever alert for a meal, is by nature and necessity a nibble creature. Below us, the fox continues to rummage. Three mismatched spurs have been set aside on a saddle blanket. A cap gun rests next to what may be the rusted hulk of a real one. A silver conch belt is slung across his chest like a bandolier. He's in the process of extricating a bolo tie from a hopelessly knotted mission rosary when the mouse noses from the mask. Sir, says Plum, wiping the sleep from her eyes. Are we there yet? Hmm? Oh, Plum, you are away. Yes, nearly there, says the fox, putting down the tangle. Sleep well? Hmm. I was hoping you could catch us a fish. Sir? Or Minnow's small school would just about do it. Or anything floating that stinks, really. The fox stretches and resumes his rummaging. I'm very tired. I'm not at all sure that I could. I haven't eaten for days. Plum wrings her little paws. Oh, well, it won't be long now. We'll dine after the duel. After, squeaks Plum. I'm not sure I will make it till after. The tiniest stomach gurgle rumbles timidly from the mouse. Oh, says Plum. The fox, who has already turned away, pulls something long and tasseled from the cowboy box, a rifle holster sans rifle. He tosses it over the edge into the sea. After a time, Plum, who has been staring at the back of the box, pipes up. Sir, mm, says the fox, holding up a pair of outsized chaps appraisingly. How will you know her when you see her? Hmm. Her, how will you know? A very good question, says the fox, folding the chaps and setting them aside. One I've asked myself. I think I won't know her when I first see her. She may be a witch, and therefore may take on any form. He looks out over the water. Therefore I have devised a series of tests and diversions. First, I assume that she must be very crafty, so I have hidden my nature from her. I have cloaked my own craftiness. I am a fox, indeed a fox's fox, but I have become a bumbler and a misfit an over-eager fool. Whatever for, pipes Plum, perhaps a little too nervously. Let's fly in a little closer. Why to draw her out? To get her measure, to see what she is made of. Plum looks anxious. She scratches her ear frenetically. It's almost wrong. Before I took on this ruse, I was heading into the duel completely blind, says the fox. Now I know exactly how best to best her. You do? How? squeaks Plum, alarmed and looking about her. Have we met her already? Plum is trembling, almost vibrating. Oh, yes, says the fox. The fox has stopped moving now, as has the mouse, as has the breeze, as has everything except for you and I. We have been caught off guard by the sudden stillness and must flutter and flap to regain our height. After an interminable time and very quietly, Plum speaks. How? She says again, 
Her voice sounds even, different, darker. With this, whispers the fox, who is quite suddenly thrown into the darkest silhouette by something brilliant before him. He scoots slowly, carefully around, and he is holding it. It is a pinprick and a supernova and where all the pollen comes from. It has gathered up every brilliance, and what it casts off embarrasses the stars. It is the only direction there ever was. It is the best thing. You and I are flying towards it. You cannot help it. It's a rhinestone, laughs Plum, in a voice not at all like a mouse. Just a stage trinket. Ha, it's not even a real cowboy thing. And in two quick hops, she has the rhinestone. I'm not as hungry as you think, she growls. And there it sits, sparkling on her powder pink tongue, the center of everything. Everything. Everything is happening too fast. Plum swallows the rhinestone, and our moths heart shriek as we follow. Snip, oh you! Snip, snap, oh me! There is confusion, and more confusion, than bright and brittle pain. You and I slowly open our mousy together. We whisk our tail. We feel foolish to let a fox lure us out to sea. Even having eaten the moths, we are too weak to cast the simplest hex, let alone transform. And even if we could, there's no room in this cursed trunk. It'd drown us both. We are backing away on tiny pink paws towards the edge of the trunk. The fox is leering close, and we are frightened, desperate. We have left a trail of droppings. <laughs> How were you going to best me with that? We find ourselves squeaking by time. We are searching our brains for a spell, an exit. There is none, but it is no time. Not yet. The rhinestone was only ever bait, answers the fox. A little bit of nest glitter to throw you off, to draw you out and close. I set the fire to get you away from shore, to keep you small and manageable. You can smell his breath. It smells huge like hunger. I had to be sure, smiles the fox. We have backed away to the utmost teetering edge of the steamer trunk, the starlit light over and below. I feel the need to apologize to you, dear listener, for the frailty of moths, for the lack of foresight, for depositing you inadvertently in the body of a mouse who appears now to be a conniving witch without your explicit permission. <laughs> but the fox is lunging, the boat is tipping, and there are so many teeth. <laughs> we hear the splash from far away, barely hear the snarl, the spray, the bubbles. We're already inside. Dark red and Smiling. Yes, that must be the steamer trunk, that little dark rectangle up above, then getting smaller. And though we find it hard to breathe, or rather not to breathe, we find we are a fox of might and mind and means. We are triumphant. We've won the duel. We wonder as we sink about an afterlife, and after this. Where do they put the bright ones, the brilliant, when they fall? We have a feeling then. We awake again, salt water fresh and sequent with a million, million stars across our glassy back. We are vast under the simple night sky, vast and full and content, for we have consumed again what has been delivered to us. For the mouse has eaten the moths, the fox has eaten the mouse, and we, the good sea, have devoured the four of them. And you, dear listener, have swallowed it all. Good night, everybody. Oh, really? Good night, everybody. Oh.